This is the Qzone podcast, giving you an in-depth insight into the Q sports industry like never before. With an inside track into all areas of the industry, we'll be opening the door for you to learn things that before only those on the inside would get to know. I am your host, Rob Reed, and enjoy the Qzone podcast. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the Qzone podcast. We have an amazing episode for you today, uh, live here with Jason Davenhill, and we are going to learn how to control our mind at the snooker table. So just to give Jason a little bit of an introduction, um, he, in a past life, many wrinkles ago, was an athlete, um, a former Royal Marine Commando, Chinook helicopter. Uh, helicopter instructor, fixed wing instructor, musician, and he's now um, taken all of that experience um, and utilized all of his successes and failures. Um, and he's put all of that, failure being me, no, I'm joking, Jason, um, he's put all of that into becoming um, one of uh, a, a very treasured friend of mine uh, and a phenomenal performance coach. Um, helping people essentially be the best versions of themselves while under extreme pressure. Um, now, Jason, your company is called Inflow Performance. Is, just That's talk correct. about why that is. Yeah, because um, I wish I could remember the the work that was done on it. But when you are um, when you're at peak performance, you, you're in the flow, uh, and and there is just nothing better than in the flow. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today, actually. And you don't even notice the time go. You, everything is just where you want it. Whatever you do, it, it is just right. And I can still remember back to when I was an athlete years ago, running around the top bend of a, an athletics track, and I'm thinking, I am absolutely flowing here, and it's just the best thing ever. And then uh, I, I linked it with the helicopters as well because we talk about the the, the, uh, the airflow through helicopter blades, so it just kind of made sense to do it. But there is just something wonderful about that that moment when everything is just functioning in the same direction. It's it's real grace under pressure. It's a it's a real joy to watch. It's a good feeling, and you can see you see when someone's actually in the flow, can't you? It's it's quite noticeable. Um, it's, it's one let, of my let me just explain. Things. Say again, sorry. It's one of my favourite things watching people do what they do best. It's just amazing. Just being the best version of themselves. It's an incredible yeah. thing to watch. Um, so just to sort of give a bit of context for, for those that are watching live on our Facebook group, the QZone podcast, um, this is a live Facebook live that we are recording for a, uh, an episode. But the benefit of those that are joined uh, with us today on uh, the Facebook group watching this live is they can comment on the video and they can ask you questions, ask me questions, formulate part of the discussion. And um, we've kind of labeled this learn to control your mind whilst at the table, um, you know, that inner chimp thing. Um, but essentially, we're going to go with where the conversation takes us. And um, if there's any requests in terms of uh, questions or learning points from anyone that's currently watching, then we can kind of take it there. We've got full flexibility in that. Uh, if you're listening to this on either YouTube, then obviously you don't have that option. Uh, unfortunately, sorry about that. And also, uh, this will go out audio only form. Uh, which is probably best if you don't want nightmares at eight o'clock in the evening whilst watching our few faces <laughs> on Facebook. Um, then um, obviously you can't um, do that. But join the Facebook group. We will have um, more lives. You will be able to interact with both of us. Um, I can't see, uh, just to give you a heads up as well, I know someone's just commented. I can't see your name, who's commented. Um, I can just see you as Facebook user, but I can still see your questions um, and all of your emojis as well, which is fun. Um, so someone's just said, uh, I could ask him a thousand questions and we haven't even started, Jason. So um, <laughs> I won't be able to answer a thousand questions. <laughs> yeah, well, we're on, we're on, a, we're on a timeline tonight. We've got to get some sleep before the 17th. Um, so, um, uh, the 17th, I'm thinking it's the 16th. That's fine. Let's not waffle anymore. And Jace, so you came as one of the expert coaches to the masterclass that we held back in last year in March yeah. last year, um, which was absolutely wonderful. We had some amazing coaches there and, and amazing students there. But your speciality was getting the best out of someone through essentially mind coaching and, and performance coaching and making them very aware of 
their inner thoughts, their inner chimp, as I'm sure you're going to explain in a little bit. Um, so you don't have um, any real knowledge about snooker or the snooker industry, um, but one of the big things that you sat in on a lot of my coaching before we went on to that masterclass, you had a really good grasp as to what people are going through in their mind, um, which is the key thing. And everyone said that they took huge amounts away from you. And I essentially wanted to open that up and show everyone how powerful this performance coaching, this mindset coaching is, even not just the professional level, because we have quite a few top players that are now using uh, both technical coaches and performance coaches. Um, but even at the grassroots level, um, all the way up. So um, do you want to just give us a quick overview as to what you saw when uh, you were at the masterclass and through the coaching and some of the biggest challenges you saw um, the players have? Well, the, the interesting thing, Robert, is that um, people are just people. And however much time you spend at the table or whatever you're doing, I mean, you and I did a lot of flying and it's, there's this real focus. You think it must be about the sticks and the stupid questions or how you hold the cue. But with, with the right practice, the, the, the holding the cue goes well. What doesn't go well and what people forget to practice is the mindset that goes with it. Uh, I might have made, made, made a note to myself here earlier that uh, anyone who's got any time at all with a cue at a table, particularly if they're out with their mates, uh, you know, if just stupidly out for a beer or something, they'll, they'll want to be able to walk up to and go one shot straight in and look cool. Because as much as we like to think we're human, and you've already mentioned it, that we are still driven by a, a primeval instinct. And the primeval instinct is to show off or is to be the biggest and the best. And quite often that comes with a threat. And when you feel that sense of threat, your whole body reacts uh, differently. Uh, I, and it was interesting just watching people as they were playing when you, you, we had a little competition, didn't we? And as soon as the competition came on, people who had been potting all day started just missing stuff or taking longer over their shots than they'd taken before or shorter or just doing something. They go, why am I doing that? And real stuff. Really, really simple things about someone pressurizing. At one point, I think you, you stood and you just talked to someone and said, OK, so everyone else is going to watch you now. And it, his shot just went to pieces. And it was just fascinating. This, As soon as there is any threat out there, your brain's going, where's the threat? Uh, and, and you mentioned the inner chimp, and, and I'd go sort of right back to the primeval being that we are. Um, if you sort of sort of follow Darwinism, we crawled out of a primeval swamp and all we originally had was fight or flight. We, we fight or flight or freeze. And that was our only response to anything. But then eventually we grew arms and legs, but we didn't grow big teeth. And uh, as sort of chimpanzees, we found ourselves about halfway up the food chain. Uh, we could eat small rodents and rabbits, but we couldn't um, eat anything bigger than a dog. And in fact, we were prey to a dog. And the biggest, the safest thing for us was to be in a group. And therefore, the most important thing for us was to remain in that group. If you get ejected from that group, it's a death sentence, but it's a slow death sentence, which is horrid. Which is, and it's terrifying, looking stupid in front of other people. But then your inner chimp also wants to climb as high up the hierarchy as possible. So it wants to look as big and brave as it can as well and show off and just not not let itself down. But often the chimp response is almost exactly the wrong response. I, I, I use an example which you, you can, if you, if you want to imagine holding a cue right now, uh, that, which is exactly the same as a chimpanzee holding onto a branch. If he's holding onto the branch and he sees something down below with big teeth, he will hold on tighter. Now, it doesn't actually make him any safer. In fact, if anything, it's more hard work to hold on that long. But, um, Holding on tighter actually means it's more likely to drop off quicker. But it, for some reason, ah, this is what I must do. I must hold on tighter. I must do stuff. And that same instance when, when you're coming up for a pressure shot, notice you hold tighter. Or notice you're a bit more tense. Or notice that, uh, okay, now I'm really going to focus on what I do. So you just completely change how you've been taking every other shot. And, you know, and let's say you, you've gone through a few competitions and now you're playing people that's important. And your, your game just goes apart completely. Um, so it's funny, just cut you off there. It, it's funny you say that because 
in the 85 final, Dennis Taylor, Steve Davis, uh, yeah. Dennis Taylor on the final black of which he potted, he the one thing that was constantly zipping through his mind was, I must not grip the cue. I must not grip the cue. Um, and he said, I was holding it so light, I wasn't even holding it. It was just resting on my fingers, just so it was so it guaranteed I didn't grip and essentially twitch. So it's funny how you said that. Yeah. And that's exactly what he was going through his, his mind there. Yeah. And, and do you know, that, and that just shows uh, so much of controlling your mind is about uh, practicing. But it, it's not the. It's not the practice in the practice hall that you imagine, which is just potting. It is actually practicing the whole setup. It is the whole walking to the table, or if it, if you're in a um, in a series of shots, every time you do the same thing. If you watch uh, to take uh, rugby, you watch Johnny Wilkinson kicking. He would always, in fact, all kickers do it now. You, you see them set up. It doesn't matter how the shot is, whether it's straight in front of the post or right out from the side. They still prepare the same way. <clears throat> they still take exactly the same amount of time. They still focus the same way, and they still strike the ball the same way. Yeah, and, that's uh, same with the pre-shot routine. Uh, that's what we go through, making sure it's. I say it all the time. No, I, I don't think there's been a recording of me yet where I haven't said the word consistency, and mm -hmm. it's all about consistency in delivery. Yeah, and we we watched that didn't we that, that weekend when and there were a couple of. Uh, lads there who who were maybe mucking around we actually stopped and said even when you're mucking around do it at the same pace just because your body the body doesn't know whether you're in a competition shot or not uh, and if you react differently in a competition shot then the body will do it differently it will make it will hold on tighter because it suddenly feels the threat but if you do the same thing every time then um you you your, your your shock, your consistency, and everything else comes out. Now, clearly, the the, the trick there is to uh, be able to do that consistency without the chimp feeling it's looking stupid. So, uh, um, go on. So, uh, what I was going to ask. So, you, you say um, we always refer back to the chimp and this primeval instinct, and it feeling a threat. And you see some of these people that you know are granite players. They, they've got the bottle. Yeah, and we see that as they've got it. They're in control. They're strutting around the table in a position of power. They're doing this. Now, I've got my own views and opinions on this, but I'd be interested to hear what an actual expert um, thinks of it. Is that an innate ability? Is that you're born with it? You are you are gifted with that? Um, if it's a primeval instinct, to, is that just bred within you, or? And we all got that and essentially all at different stages, different levels, and it affects us differently based on, you know, nature, nurture. Um, but all of those people that we see that are in that controlling element and they can control their mind, is that a conscious, developed skill? I, I think it's an analogue curve. You, there are, just like a lot of things, some people find it easier to do than others. I was talking to a friend earlier about dancing and, you know, rhythm. And, you know, you and I know a lot, a lot about rhythm. And you kind of say, some people have got rhythm, some other people haven't. And I, I think it's very much an ability with, with rhythm to be able to listen to the rhythm and relate to what you're doing. And in the same way, the granite, there will be some who possibly just aren't as aware of the distractions as others. Uh, again, if we get back to your flying training, there are some guys who were able to just go through the course because they just didn't worry about what the instructor was doing because they, they, they had, and I would almost argue it was actually probably a downside. It was great for flying training because it looked like, oh yeah, he can do it every time. But um, for later on, when you're actually wanting to be able to, to broaden out and live, work with a crew and everything else, that ability to listen and, and, and take in all the inputs is very important. Some guys, they just couldn't do it. But other people who were very aware of what the instructor was doing. And, and, and we, when I say the instructor from a flying side, it's exactly the same with audience or your competitor or whatever in a game of snooker. Some people are more aware of what they're doing. And therefore, you, have to, you, you just have to work harder on the distraction control. And that comes with practice. Uh, and the practice is the whole of, as Rob was talking about, the pre-shot pre routine, Really just take it, and, and even before you do the pre-shot routine, 
is actually getting the body in the right sense. So just making sure that you're grounded before you then go and take the shot. Because if you go into your pre-shot routine and even maybe take longer over a shot because it's an important one, you've now got time for the, the little doubts to worm in. And all that time the doubts worm in, you, you grip a little bit tighter. And then you, you aim a bit and then, right, no, this is an important shot. I'm really going to concentrate here. Uh, and suddenly it, it goes out the window. So for some, it would probably take more effort to be able to ground yourself. But I would argue there's every chance that those who find themselves a little bit more distracted possibly have greater gifts at being able to imagine. Um, you just just do a body scan and, and imagine themselves back into the, the right spot. So, so no matter how difficult you might find it, if you find it extremely difficult, there is still like that end line that you can get to. It just takes more graft. Is that? Yeah, it takes more. And, and, and it's something to, to remember in the practice. School. So yeah. it's interesting because when you're saying about um, actually getting your body centered, in, in terms of a snooker for, for people watching this, and my immediate thought about that was making sure your body's on the, the line of the shot and you're centered to the shot. But actually what you're talking about there is making sure you, your, your chi, as it were, is, uh, is centered before you even go into your technical part of the pre-shot routine. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because we always say, uh, I say we, me, I always say, I'm not going to speak for all coaches out there, uh, but as part of the pre-shot routine, you get your body on the line of the shot, on the line yeah. of the shot. Um, so, um, and part of that reason is because it it instantly makes you focus. It yeah. instantly puts you into, right, this is what I'm doing. This is my focus now. I don't care about what's happening else uh, elsewhere. I don't care about the 700 unread emails that I left at work. I don't care about, I am now in position to think about this shot and this shot alone. And it's funny because as as commanders in the military, both both you and I, um, even outside of flying, you can't really do this in a cockpit, but outside of flying, um, we're taught when you need to take a step back, you physically take a step back. You can't yeah. see any more of the battlefield by taking a step back. But because you've just done that to your body, you've just focused your mind and you can now actually see more of the, the battlefield and therefore more of the strategic picture. So essentially we're doing that, but in snooker, right? Yeah, exactly that. And in fact, that's a, that's a great comment that I, I always thought anyone listening right now, if you just got everyone just to sit back a bit and then just breathe out and then just notice what that does to your body. Even that just sitting back a bit, breathing out, and just feeling that relaxation and then almost just imagine the relaxation down the shoulders and down the backs of your arms and into your fingertips. And then I would step forward. Oh, sorry. Then I would go into my pre-shot pre routine. But even just that, that focus, because in any pressure situation, situation you, you find yourself doing this. I mean, if, if I asked anyone watching right now just to think about it, just bring your shoulders forward, just notice how... Bring your focus in. And that, again, is, is a very chimp reaction. But the more there's a threat out there, I, I was going to sort of talk about you know, 200,000 years ago when early man was hunting across the African savanna. If he was out and he saw a movement in the, in the grass, he would, he would absolutely focus on that until he'd worked out whether it was a tiger or something edible. Um, and we are still programmed. To, and we bring this focus right in here. But actually, that's not necessarily the best survival instinct. Either. The best survival instinct is always to, to step back and, and look at the bigger picture about, OK, where am I going to run if this is the case? But we're, we're trained, we're, we're programmed for some reason to bring the focus in. And it, it is so, so true. And, and Dennis Taylor with his, right, just keep the, the grip relaxed, is just that moment or two just to sit back. Um, helicoptering, again, I would find myself you know, hovering at night and you're trying to pick up a load and the crewmen are talking to and you're, you're feeling under pressure from what they're saying, even though they are just trying to do their job and you know they're trying to do their job. My inner chimp didn't want to let them down, so I'm like this and I'm getting more... And I would have to say, okay, let's just um, give yourself a moment and literally just 
roll my shoulders back. And, and I encourage anyone to watch just now, just roll your shoulders back and just see what that does to you, what that does to your stance, your balance and your view. And my view is now, what, two inches back, but I can see more and I'm smiling more. Do you notice how I'm now happier? So, yeah, so it's a fascinating comment, Rob. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to get to this sort of by the end, but I'm, I just want to know the answer now because I, <laughs> I, I, we'll, we'll get to this other stuff uh, in a minute. But essentially, I, I want some actionable points um, for people that can sort of actually take this to now the clubs are back open, take this to the club and actually use in real life, take it to matches and things like that. Um, but I want to start with one of the hardest things in snooker. And um, we've mentioned Dennis Taylor quite a few times, but on the interview that I did with him on the Q-Zone podcast um, a number of episodes ago, we talked about the differences between golf and snooker. So supposedly I, I posed him that uh, golf was the hardest, uh, most skill demanding sport there was. Uh, and snooker was second, a close second to that. Uh, and he argued the point that actually snooker is the most um, challenging game that there is. Because in golf, if your opponent has a really good swing and makes, say, a birdie, you have the opportunity to do the same and not lose out. Whereas in snooker, if your opponent is on the table and clears up, you're, you've sat there and you, you cannot do anything. So what can we do when we're being demoralized by sitting in our chair, watching our opponent clear up? Because ultimately... Um, I think it, in our in, initial mindset, that's a, he's better than me. He's do, he's beating me. I'm not as good as him. But actually, we haven't had a chance to prove ourselves yet. We might have just had a, a mistake where we've missed a ball or left him on to allow him into that. Um, but on the next frame, we've got the chance to, to do the same. But it's funny how our mindset spirals us into, all right, well, we're probably now going to lose. So you watch a lot of the amateur stuff. You what if you've lost two frames in a row, you're probably going to lose the 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 set that you know the, the match itself. And um, so, what can we do whilst we're sitting in our seat to mentally prepare for when we get our opportunity at the table? Colin, interesting question. I'll uh, start with the hard ones. We'll get on to the easier ones later. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Thank you. Um, first thing that came to mind is is just to to remind yourself about the circle of concern. What can you do about the guy on the table? Yeah. Nothing. So there is nothing you can do. All you can do is think about your next shot. And you can't even think about your next shot because you won't even know where the ball is. But what you can do is maybe think about your um, uh, your, your preparation, the warm-up. Actually, probably a good time just to almost go back into yourself and go through a body scan. You know, like we were talking about earlier about sleeping at night as well. Just ground yourself back in again. Just take the time maybe to really focus on your feet. To see what you can notice about your feet. Really take the interest in that. Um, then, you know, bring your attention up your, up your body. Your legs, what are they doing? Where am I sitting on this one here? But maybe bring it, eventually aiming to bring it up to your, your body, up, up to your breathing. And focus on your breathing because you have to breathe. And just play with your breathing for a while. Don't make it big or small, but just breathe it in, breathe it out. And, and we've just spent the time talking about shoulders again. Well, how quickly do they tense up? Just spend the time again doing that. Maybe even treat yourself. How often? I was talking to my son earlier actually about this when we were running. Um, how often, you know, the, the girls particularly the, the, the girls go off to you know spend a lot of money at spas and stuff just to be pampered you know because it just feels lovely having someone doing your shoulders well how often do you actually stop and just go oh oh look that's my shoulders there. it feels quite nice to spend some time just thinking about your shoulders really just bring your attention there and into your arms again you've got time you've got st stuff to do that there's there's nothing you can do about your next shot other than just um just get your body ready and you know if you're bored doing that then maybe just take yourself imagery of yourself back to <coughs> excuse me the, the practice one 
the the days when you felt really good. Just take yourself back to a place where <clears throat> you can feel you were having a great day and what you were doing on that great, what it felt like on that day, and maybe just really build up that extension, maybe even just squeeze your finger as you're doing it. And just feel that moment, just release that pressure. And then maybe before you step up and you'll go again, squeeze your finger again, just to remind yourself what it felt like. Step up, take a moment or two just to stand. And then think, it is just another shot. Whatever you've got in front of you, the number of times you have played that shot, it is so difficult, though, not to think about the opponent. But you can't do anything about it. Uh, the circle of concern, I mentioned that briefly. We have, if you imagine your head as a, as a, a circle, and you've got two circles inside it. One is the circle of influence, and the other is the circle of concern. If you, um, if you just focus on what you're concerned about, you, you run out of capacity to think about what you can influence. Whereas if you bring your attention to what you can influence, and at the stage when you're sitting on your chair, waiting for your opponent, you can influence your breathing and just maybe how you feel. But if you bring all your attention to there, you, you, you don't have the time, you don't have the capacity to think about what, what, uh, what you're concerned about. So that is, that is where I'd go with that one. Uh, and I, I made a note here as well, warm up. In fact, I was just thinking about it. Uh, it, it might be worth, as people go back to the practice halls, just come up with some sort of mnemonic and just work out a, a, a mnemonic that uh, a mnemonic is a is a, um, is a is a reminder or is a series of actions that, that you know come up with a, a word to spell or something. For flying side, Rob, you remember we used to have lookout attitude instruments. We teach people to go lookout attitude instruments, and when everything else is going wrong, just go back to the basics. Is that right? Is that right? Yep. Okay, now I can focus on what I need to do again. But you always, you, you need something just to bring you back to reality. And I, I was just thinking of sort of some sort of mnemonic that will probably involve uh, a warm, some sort of warm-up, not a, maybe a, not a physical warm-up, just a, a warm-up to bring your focus back into where it is on your body, on how your breathing is, how everything is, is balanced. Then into prepare. Then into take a shot clearly, uh, and I'll put down here celebrate, because after every shot, your inner chimp wants a vote. It wants to be able to say, that was brilliant, or, oh, God, I'm the worst person ever. And it will want to do that, and it, it, it needs a vote. You can't tell it to shut up, so you just give yourself a moment or two to go, yeah, or no. Uh, and then I'll put down here evaluate, because just no, whilst there's a certain temptation not to want to take too long over the preparation of a shot, because in case you look silly in front of someone else, no one will notice if you just after you've taken a shot, just go, okay, have a look. Did you follow through far enough? Did you, was the, was the strength right? Was the aim point? Where did I actually hit it? And, and really, really, really drill down into where did I hit that ball? Where, what, what was my plan like? You know, um, did I come up with the right plan? Was I going to take it off three cushions, 15 cushions? Was that a reasonable plan? Going for the snooker, was that the option or was the pot the option? But, you know, think about that. Then how well did I create the, the plan? And then the actual finish of the shot, did I follow through? Whenever you watch Rob coaching, he's always just got the cue at the end and he just looks to see how far it's gone through. Was it? the right strength of shot? Did it go off at the right speed? What do I need to change? And that, again, is that kind of evaluation that brings it back. But inevitably, what you do is you just go, oh, God, why did I do that? Or, yes, yes. <laughs> and you it's run that like, like, match, yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting because um, the... The prep and the shot. So the, the prep for, for in terms of what we coach is pre-shot routine. The shot is the shot routine. Um, and then you see the celebrating evaluation is a really interesting thing because um, a lot of people stop at the shot. Uh, and that's, I think, where they lose it for the next shot because they need they don't finish that cycle. So they don't start the cycle again. Um, and there's a couple of things I wanted to pick up on there. Um, firstly, celebrate is a is an emotional thing, and the evaluate is a logical thing. Two parts of the brain, uh, and we need essentially a balance of both. So that 
if you sort of celebrate or commiserate whatever you want want to do or need to do at that moment, um, that's your emotional bit. Once you've done, got the emotional bit out of the way, you can then start to contemplate the logical bit. And I think it was you that mentioned um, to me uh, many years ago when we were going through this, through um, when we were flying in the military, that uh, Tiger Woods used to have um, a, a method of how to allow his chimp um, to go haywire, but it, he he was in control. How did he do that? Yeah, he, he imagined um, that there was a little brook between where he shot the, hit the ball and where it landed. And all the way to the brook, he would allow, allow his inner chimp to go, yes, or hmm. And then he would cross the bridge of this little brook. And from there on in, um, he was focused on the next shot. Uh, and you can do the same around the table because inevitably you will have to change position. So you maybe kind of pick a pocket or something and go right up to that pocket. I will just go, yeah, happy with that. And when I reach that pocket onto the next place place there, I will now bring my focus back in again. I will now start to go back into my routine. And, and you're so right, Rob, about the 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 celebrate and, and the whole routine. So celebrate, evaluate what worked, and then because if you, if you break that if you break that routine, then your body's going, oh, so we're not in the practice room anymore. We're not in the hundred one four seven break room. We're in the just chance it and see if we can fluke a win. Time of world. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny isn't it um because it it's and we all do it we all do it in life right not just snooker i'm not talking just about snooker we do all do it in life when it comes to the crunch and we're at the test we're at the at the table um that decides fate um we just decide that we can do it differently for some reason um yeah. in, in in contrast to the way that we've been practicing for it which is mental when you think about it when you like seriously think about it but then we just naturally do it but then when you're in a different emotional state of mind or you know if you get punched in the face you're going to you know see a little bit of that red mist right yeah. and but probably that red mist and it's really hard to think logically when you've got an overhaul of emotion yeah so um yeah allowing that emotion as part of the journey as part of that routine um stops you from being a robot if you could achieve it, but otherwise stops it from being thrown out the window if you can't achieve it. Well, it's, it's also the case that your inner chimp is like the child in the back of the car. You know, if you tell it to shut up, it will start kicking off properly. Yeah. You almost just have to let it roll for a minute and then move on again uh, and, and, you know, almost take it with you. Yeah. And it's important to do the evaluation part, even if you've got success. Because, yeah. And I think one of the best players that actually does this is Sean Murphy. Um, I was in the uh, practice um, in the practice room with him uh, January last year, and was it last year or this year? Can't remember. But it, it, anyway, w he was saying that doesn't matter if the ball goes in. He wanted the ball to go in a certain part of the pocket, no matter how yeah. tight the pockets are. And if it goes in the other side of the pocket or the part that he didn't want, he will evaluate that and go, okay, how, why, and what do I need to essentially concentrate on what part of, and it's always down to what part of the um, pre-shot routine did I miss or the shot routine did I miss? Um, and part of that pre-shot routine could be, oh, I just rushed into it. I didn't allow myself time to just settle in and take that step back, you know, roll the shoulders back. Um, and I think it's fascinating. Um, so we were talking uh, before this about sleep patterns um, and how my sleep has been terrible for many, many years. Um, and I've been working on it really hard for the last few months and getting myself into routine. And, and it's that putting that structure in there actually gets my mind to go, ah, right, I get it. This is the routine. And if I don't do any part of that now, my mind can, if it does play up, it's because I've missed part of that routine. So what I'll do is I'll just take a step back. Doesn't matter what time of the night it is. Um, I'll take a step back and go, right, let's do that routine again. You know, candle goes on, sleep music goes on, I get my book out and I read a few pages of the book uh, and make sure that I've got everything in my routine set. So it doesn't matter what area of life we're doing this in, snooker is exactly the same. If you don't feel comfortable any part of that and you feel off-kilted or you're put off, cough in the audience, or whether that's just your mind going, you're going to miss this, you're going to miss this, stop step back and just reset. Yep. 
because you might have missed something that's allowed your mind to do that. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. When you're at the table, um, so the co common things for, for people are they miss the easy shots, right? Just potted some amazing hard shots, but miss the easy ones. Or they've got this stumbling block where they've got their um, they've got their 48 break, but they can't get over that hurdle of the 50 break. Or they've got their 97 break, but they can't get over the hurdle of the century break, um, which is a mental block, right? If you're making if you're making 50 breaks, you've got the capacity and capability to make 100 a century break because you've got the skill set there. You've proven that by the fact that you're potting a break of 50. Okay, You can't just string that together by fluke. I, I, I know a couple of people that might be able to, but you can't generally just string it together by fluke. How can you take, a, take that step back when you, when you need it? How can you identify that? And then what can you do mid mid routine interesting one um the part of that will come from a belief uh if, if i said to you now don't think about the pink elephant you're probably now thinking about the pink elephant yeah when you get when you get to 98 you go ah yeah i can't do 100 or if you say to yourself no i can do 100 by when you say to yourself i can do 100 your inner belief is now saying why are you telling me that is it because you don't believe it really? And it becomes this big number that you, you, you've almost you've made it something beyond where you can. And, and in many ways, you've almost created this, well, I can't make the 100. Why not? Because I can't. And yeah, no, I can make the 100. Um, and and I, I was just thinking as you were talking there, in fact, I, I was just rewinding slightly as well thinking about uh, what to do if you're, if you're sitting in the chair for a long time and maybe using a bit of imagery would help and and actually imaging what it looks like and what it feels like to be at 104 say you know if you look up at the board and yeah 104 we haven't even got the 100 there as a the as, as this blocker point but just almost the, the shots and what the those um what, what those look like I and mean, and they look the same uh, and i was just going to talk about uh, imagery quickly because that's a really really powerful tool that you can do a lot for yourself and that thing we did uh, at the coaching course that you, you videoed rob uh, with imagery is it's you can almost imagine it like um uh, when you take your car down to get service these days the engine is so complicated they just plug a test set in and they run the engine through the test set and your brain's the same and if, if you can create all all five senses into your brain and then the picture that you're after you, you can then almost image what it looks like to be at 104 or 110 or whatever and just knowing that it's the same shot and you can mentally practice that because actually practicing beyond 100 in the practice room is probably impossible as well because you go oh i can't do it i can never do it so you never get to that point but you can use imagery with it and what i'd recommend with it with imagery if you wanted to go down that route was again just sort of give yourself some truisms like feet are on the floor the chair is supporting my back my hands are where they are and then really take the time to imagine all five senses and quite possibly maybe start with the, the less aware one. So what can you smell? And, you know, as, as I'm talking now, just imagine what you could smell in a, in a snooker hall. Can you smell the bays? Can you smell the chalk? What else can you smell? Clearly, if there's someone in the third row who's broken wind, then you're in trouble. <laughs> but, you know, what, what are the smells that you can actually bring in and really take the time to bring that in? And then... Even what can you taste? You know, when you're in those situations, is your is your mouth dry or, or moist, or is there any, any particular taste you can have? Is there a favourite drink you have? Is it like lemonade or something? Is there something you, you could almost taste? So you, you've got that feeling there as well. And then we bring on coming to the more aware ones, like um, what can you hear? You know, is it quiet? Is there chatter? Is there, are there several other tables around? Is that, is that that same sort of click, that really lovely sound of ball striking ball, but on another table, that, you know, that almost distraction. But again, if you can just bring that in and understand 
the rhythm that that goes with and, and enjoy that. And then what can you see? And if you bring your attention right into, okay, I'm just looking at this ball here, and this is the point when you're in a chimp's game, God, we've got a hundred here, we've got to go for this, no, we're not going to play this one. And again, you just go through that whole shot routine. And you don't say to yourself, it is just another shot. Because you're in a chimp will go, or you're in a belief will go, why are you telling me it's another shot? Oh, it's not, is it? Oh, it's a big one. <laughs> Yeah, because um, Chris Henry is a fantastic coach and he does a lot of mindset coaching with his um, with his um, students, with his clients. And I was speaking to um, Sean Murphy when we were in the practice room and he was telling me the story of when he was struggling to make uh, a 147 break. He'd not made a 147 break in competition all the time in the practice hall. Um, and so... Chris set up the colours on their spots and put one red on the table. By the black, he's in, just went, clear it. And he went, uh, but why? And for, and for an amateur player, um, you know, in a club that, that, that's fairly handy on a snooker table, can easily do that, right? Red, black, clear the colours. It's, it's a fairly standard thing that you can do. So for a top professional player, he was just like, well, this seems pointless, um, and he was in a club with uh, other people around and he potted the red, landed perfectly on the black and he went 115 <laughs> as loud as he could. And then, and then Sean sort of looked over and was like, what? And then he was like, but, uh, but I'm not, this is ridiculous. Potted the black and then he went 122. And then got into the yellow and was like, Oh, and then people started sort of gathering around and thought, oh, I could, he could do this, right? He, he could actually do this. I've got my numbers mixed up. I don't know why I just completely biffed the numbers. Um, but he then start his heart started racing and I'll be picked. The reason I just said I biffed the numbers is because I'll be picked up on that by everyone. I'll just get loads of comments going, you don't know what the scores are in Stoker. Um, yeah, you're probably right. There's, there's, a, there's a pink ball somewhere. That's all I know. Um, it's, it's, it's next to the purple ball. Um, so anyway, he said like my heart's racing. Um, he was getting, he's getting sweaty and he's like, I, I know, like, I feel like a liar, but because this isn't right, but everyone believes that he's on for the one, four, seven. So they stop and start watching. It's like, John's going to make a one, four, seven, like, which even in a practice session is, is pretty cool to see. So they all stop and look over and he's like getting all this pressure and all this, threat, and then misses. He misses on a simple, simple clearance that he would do in his sleep 50 times out of 50. Yeah. So what can you then do when you're in that moment of, right, people are watching me. I'm expected to take the next shot. I've got all of these threats threatening my prime, primeval instinct, um, but I've got to act in the next few seconds. What can you do then? Like your heart's beating in 100 miles an hour. Your, your breathing's all messed up. You're not probably in the mind state and, and, or have the time to sit there and go, what are my toes doing? What are my shoulders doing? And um, so, so what can you do in that sort of environment where it is high pressured? What did Cliff Thorburn do? Do you remember? Say again, sorry. First televised 147, what did Cliff Thorburn do? Oh, he went, went and sort of sat down and wiped his hands and... Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You not, know, we, 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 why, yeah. Yeah, why not? Yeah, we, we've, we've just talked, you know, we've just talked about the whole, you know, you, you were talking about being uh, in, in your working through the route. Oh, we've got some issues. Sorry, Jason, you're uh, cutting out a little bit. You still there? Right. Right. Happened. Sorry, say that again. We went. Okay. Um, you know, we, we, we've just talked about the fact that it's it's the whole routine. But and, and you've just come to a, a cracking point there, which I sort of thought about earlier. The you're in a chimp doesn't want to be seen to be weak by stopping and slowing down. 
So it thinks it still needs to carry on. But if it's not on form, it needs to stop. I made a made a note here, strangely, um, about, you know, if you're on a night out and, and someone's about to kick off and you hear people say, leave it, it's not worth it. And it takes everything in your body to, to walk away rather than fight the threat. And, you know, there are times when the emotion is higher. And you think how long it takes people to calm down when they're in that environment. But you need to get back to that situation first. And there will be days when you're in a chimp who's right up there like that. And But that is a practice. And that was the genius of that, was, was exposing that situation of this is what it feels like, so that you've then got time to, to go back and get, ah, so it's not about the potting. It's not about the pre-shot routine. It's about the, the preparation around it. It's about the warm-up. It's about getting – and. You know, you, you talked about just the, the pre-shot, but it's the everything before that as well. It's getting the same heart rate before you get into that shot. And if there's suddenly a lot of people around, you maybe have to find some sort of way of deflecting the attention. Like, oh, I'll tell you, I'm just going to get a drink. You know, those times when you're, again, if it is not as worth it. If you go to the loo, say, it is time just to, put your head against the wall, <laughs> go, what am I doing? And then walk out. But it, 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 there is, you, you know, the, the, the word emotion, if you take the letter E off it, what, what does it become? Emotion. Yeah, it's what drives us. Uh, and it's so, so, so powerful. And as soon as, uh, and that is a classic example of the chimpanzee, he doesn't want to be ejected from the truth. And right now, he this is his opportunity to show his blue bottom to the rest of the troop. And the rest of the troop is there. And this is his make or break moment. Tell you what, I'm just going to go for a drink. Yeah, I'm desperate for wee. Anything like that. You know, you know some, some way of diffusing the situation, stepping away from it and bringing yourself back in again. And taking that time, and you know, the more you do it, the better you get at practicing. If you go back to flying training, you you think about how how much better it went when when you'd had more practice at just rolling into things. So that's that's um, fantastic sort of life advice in terms of, as we said right at the beginning, you know, physically taking that step back. Um, yeah. In a match of snooker, however, um, I, I do get at 100 percent and everyone here will agree um, understand what you're saying. In a, in, a, in a game of snooker, doing that, it, it can be seen as unsportsmanly um, because essentially it could be seen as you're just trying to keep your opponent in their seat. Um, and yeah. not, you can't do that when you're on a televised table, for example, or a formal competition. Um, it will just spark up a bit of bad blood. And also you might even go to, as far as the ref will give you a warning for, for unsportsmanlike conduct. So is there some sort of like, which, which, sorry. Which, which is why you need to, you need to just practice doing it shorter. Sure. You okay. know, so, so, so the simple thing, like for instance, okay, I have a mnemonic, I have a work cycle. You know, you know, when you, when you, when you first go out to do it, you know, playing the piano, for instance, or, or, you take forever to learn the chords, but gradually you get better at being able to, to do it straight off. And you can pick up pieces of it earlier. But, you know, taking the time in the practice hall to, okay, what can I relax? We talked about 7-Eleven breathing earlier. And uh, if you practice it a lot, you know, when you're driving home, when you're, you, you find yourself a bit stressed, if you practice all that stuff, it becomes easy to invoke when you're in a pressure situation. So it might just be enough to go. And that might just be enough to bring it all down again. But if you've never practiced that and you wait until the day in the hall and they go, right, yes, I'm fine. <laughs> and that was the genius of that. You know, here we are in the practice hall and you can, you can clear up like that any day. But now there are 15 people watching. How does that feel? And you go, bloody hell, I ju- you know, I just don't know how to deal with that, uh, that situation. Okay, the situation isn't the shot. The situation is getting yourself back into that, into that group. How so do you do that? It, it's interesting, isn't it? So it's, it's hard to imagine practicing this 
in the practice hall, but that's exactly what we need to do is no matter what, you know, create environments for ourselves that, that invoke that sort of heart rate, just that rise in heart rate, just so we can practice this, this cycle, this rhythm. And as you said, you know, whatever that mnemonic is, and we, we're not going to come up with one. I'm not going to spend the time doing it. And I wouldn't ask you to do that anyway. Um, because ultimately everyone here needs to do that themselves. They need to experiment with all these techniques um, to find out what works best for them. So for example, having a sleep playlist on Spotify to send me to sleep or help as part of my routine to sleep might not be the best thing for someone else. So um, it's, no. it's going through that. So spend a bit of time just writing down all of the different techniques you can help to relax. Um, several level of breathing is one of them, which I'm going to ask you to just talk through in a minute because we mentioned it, but uh, some of the viewers might not know exactly what that is. Fairly self-explanatory, but it'd be good to go through. Um, but write all of them down. Try all of them in pr situations where your heart rate's elevated. Um, and then the ones that work really well, then implement that into a mnemonic. Or just write up a mnemonic, try it, practice it, if that doesn't work or you want to tweak it, then do that. But so, yeah, you mentioned 7-Eleven breathing. What, what is that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, if <laughs> when you breathe in, your shoulders go up. That is your fight or flight stance. That is your, your sympathetic nervous system is getting ready to kick off. You know, when a pressure situation is gone, you breathe out. Then you go. Oh. And therefore, if you can. If you breathe in for a count of seven and, and breathe out for a count of 11, then you're, you're spending more time calming your body down. And, and when you breathe in, I, I'm talking about breathing right and filling your lungs and right down to your stomach, so pushing your belt buckle out. We're breathing in a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. In, two, three, four, five. So that's the sort of cadence you want, maybe even slower than that, but That'll kind of, so just spending more time breathing out than breathing in it, uh, excites the parasympathetic nervous system, which is part of calming down. So, something you were talking, as you were talking there, Rob, um, we talk about in the practice hall or at the table. But if it's something that you're passionate about, why not take it out with you? You know, when you are at work or driving somewhere, just take the time to notice what your body is doing. Because there will be days when someone cuts you up and you just want to shout at them. Great, heightened emotion. Can you calm yourself down in that situation? You know, uh, there are maybe if you're out walking, just take the time to notice what you notice around yourself. Where are you happiest? Take that time, then sit there maybe, and then think through your your favourite shots or calming yourself down. Any one of those. If you, the more you can bring those links so that it isn't just in the practice hall or it isn't just at the competition table, but outside and you spend more time just practicing getting your body, you then don't need to do it in front of the live TV camera or the referee who's about to dock your point. Uh, practicing those things you can practice away from the table. We talked about imagery. You can practice a, a whole shot or a whole series of shots sitting on a park bench if you want or maybe walking. Uh, anything that where you're relaxed and your mind is completely different and then you just bring this the same time in but when you image it take the same amount of time if not more rather than yeah there we go, got that shot done take that time to, to practice the whole body preparing itself for that shot i've barely talked about shots so it's just uh, the preparation around it well I, that's 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 key isn't it ultimately the, the shot is is the technical element you know, the shot doesn't have, you know, the mind doesn't have control over the actual shot when it's in motion. That's all down to the technique, but the mind affects the technique. So, you know, yeah. if you have the technique, you can play the shot. But if you haven't got the mindset, it's going to really screw up your technique, which is going to screw up your shot. You know, it's all this, this knock on effect. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take questions if we have any, if we've not covered uh, elements that people want to. Um, and... So if you are watching live, do ask questions. We have had just one in, and I'm probably going to just quickly answer this um, because ultimately it's what the entire uh, episode has been about. But uh, if you want to add anything uh, to it, you can, Jason. So the question was, how 
how do you deal with nerves and pressure? So pressure is essentially what we've been talking about, that the outside threats, those, those influences, that, that elevated heart rate. Now, nerves and pressure, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, I understand that both of those have that same sort of physiological effect in terms of you have that elevated heart rate, your palms sort of get sweaty and you tense up maybe, um, and you might even forget things. Um, and we, we've essentially covered that in sense of preparation in terms of having your mnemonics, having your routines, pre-shot, pre-pre-shot, you know, pre-shot and, and shot routine, but post-shot routine as well. We talked about the cele um, celebrate or commiserate and evaluate those uh, emotional and logical uh, thought processes after a shot before you can then repeat that cycle. Um, so yeah. anything to add to that? I have got a question for you to kick things off whilst people have a think about what they want to ask. Just, just being aware that, that nerves are mostly because you don't know what, it, you, it's what, even what if thing. Uh, what if this? Well, when it comes along, deal with it. But for the minute, you, you nerves, you get this sensation of nerves and people, um, you, people love to, when you can label something, it becomes real. Years ago, my daughter, I took her to Orson Towers and, uh, she was saying, oh, you know, I'm feeling nervous about uh, the, the going on the ride. I said, why, why is that? She said, oh, because of the crash two weeks, two years ago, two months ago, whatever. And I thought, no, actually, that is your body um, getting, its ready, getting itself ready to fight or flight. The, the heart rate is going up. The, the, your, your, your skin's sweating slightly just to cool yourself down because you, it, it is the equivalent of when you're walking into a forest once upon a time, you didn't know what was going to be around the corner. You had to be ready to run and your heart rate, your blood had to be pumping ready to go. So your stomach is now not um, digesting food because that's a waste of time. And, and you notice all of that because you're about to go into a threat environment and you then attach a, a label to it. And when you attach a label to it, I am now suffering from nerves. But it's the the hardest thing to try and just bring your attention back to well, what can I control? And that's why we talk about the breathing. That's why we've just done seven eleven breathing because you can control. You can breathe in. You can breathe out, and you can notice that. And you have to breathe. So bring your attention back into what you've got, and then think about well, okay, what can I do with my shots? Prepare properly. Go through my mnemonic properly. What happened? You know. What do I need to do if I haven't done something? As Rob said, go back to the start and do it again. And it's going back to what you said earlier, that circle of influence versus the circle of concern. You know, what you might be concerned about, you, you certainly might not be able to influence. So let's go back to, okay, what's in the circle of concern that I can influence? Um, and if it's, yeah. not, if it's not in the circle of influence, well, there's no point worrying about it because then I'm just using energy and effort uh, and mind power, brain power, thinking about something... It's can't control it's very difficult there to say to and i was going to make a note here about just listen to yourself talk because if you say to yourself i shouldn't worry about this i shouldn't be nervous there's no point worrying about it you have now reminded yourself that you're worrying about it or <laughs> that you've got nerves or any one of those so as soon as you go oh, i shouldn't be doing that you then feel doubly bad because you're doing it you go, why am i doing that? oh i'm just the worst person in the world because i'm thinking about that uh, and it's so so difficult you almost mustn't say you know, i'm doing it myself um, you kind of just go what's my breathing doing it's not i wonder what my breathing's doing because i better concentrate on this because you've said now i better concentrate on this which suggests that you're not and you're now believing that you're not doing it, it, it it's a real it's like a double triple whammy just like, just concentrate on breathing you know? and Brilliant. there will be all sorts of arguments doing on that Sorry, so, Just whilst with um, anyone else that wants to ask a question, because we have covered a huge amount. And I, I think in terms of the topic that we're wanting to go through today, um, we've been pretty comprehensive. So thank you for that. But I'm going to put you on the spot. Pretty big. Never. Yeah, no. <laughs> Surely not you, Rob. Right. I, I'd like to know, because I think it's it's interesting that um, both you and I are fascinated by by mindsets and by this whole sort of performance aspect. So um, I will kick it off and give you a bit of time to think. Okay, but I want I, I'd love to know a time where you have failed at implementing this yourself. 
Uh, and I, I want to kick this off um, and I'll give you a bit of time to think about that because there's a couple of things that I want to say. Um, in terms of we met when we were flying, okay? Um, and the reason is when I got to the rotary stage, so flying helicopters, uh, I went into an amazing team. My boss was the best boss I've ever worked for. Uh, and rightly so, he's been promoted to the highest rank that he could in the military that is possible uh, for someone uh, like him uh, and well deserved. Um, but I immediately went to them and said, I'd like performance coaching. Now, as you know, in the industry, uh, in terms of the f uh, aviation industry, uh, especially the military, but it's actually you know, the mindset of a lot of the snooker industry as well as others, you know, just general society, performance coaching, mindset coaching was seen to be something that you only got if you were failing, if you were weak, if you couldn't handle the day to day ins and outs of things. And and I because I had this sort of like growth mindset, I wanted to be as good as I could be uh, because I'm a perfectionist. There's a, a, a bad reason for that really good uh, mindset. But perfectionist i wanted to be perfect i had to be perfect otherwise i saw myself as a failure i wanted performance coaching and and therefore i came to you and and you started my journey on learning a lot of this stuff and you you helped me uh, be a very successful uh, student in, in the rotary world and i was getting extremely good grades um they weren't perfect i don't think anyone is in the aviation industry especially in the military but so therefore i felt like i was failing and we had many discussions where I was really down, really hard on myself. Um, and I could not go through, and this is anyone that's flown a helicopter before or flown at all, um, you have to go through a set of checks beforehand, okay? Um, uh, in a helicopter, there's quite a lot to go through. And we flew jet engine, um, AS350, um, HT1s and 2s, uh, which is a squirrel helicopter. And there is a comprehensive set of checks and it's a fairly, they try and make it fairly simple in terms of there's a flow, there's a pattern, there's, you know, mnemonics, there's things to help you remember them, but you have to learn them off by heart, verbatim, and make sure that everything's right. Because if the slightest thing's off, it could be catastrophic when you're in the air um, if it has not gone effects. Uh, and we were talking, and I'd done this hundreds of times, and I couldn't remember the checks. And I got I, I started getting berated for not learning the checks. And the more and more um, I, I allowed that, my inner chimp, to have that reaction, uh, I could not step back. And therefore, I could not complete those checks. Um, so that was my failure. And that was fairly late in, right? So I was behind the curve of everyone else. I was getting great grades when I was in the air, but I was behind the curve. Um, and what you said to me is something that you picked up on um, earlier in the podcast. And you said about imagery. And you said, well, work back. Just start from when you're in the air doing really well. Then work back of leaving the gates or leaving the airfield, uh, which you can do and you know how to do that. And that's fine. And then work back and then work back. And then you're, you started in this relaxed enjoyment state. So your heart rate's relaxed. And you can kind of focus in a lot more and be more aware of yourself. And then when you get to the checks part, you will be in a better mind state to then be able to carry out those checks of which you know you, what you need to do. Um, and from that point on, I never, I never missed the checks. I never forgot them. I was really confident with them and um, it was extremely fluent. And as I said, I caught up to the rest of my peers essentially overnight, just by that one technique. So um, that's essentially one of my sort of failures and, and ways of implementing what you've said there in a non-snooker context. Have you got any in, whether that's in your athletics, uh, when you're a Royal Marine Commando, when you're an instructor, um, or a, a, even since you mentioned about being, you know, pretty peeved off in a car, but have you done anything since where you've essentially had that failure and gone, right, this is why I'm then going to instigate some of these techniques. Oh, all the time. Every day is a learning day. You talk about growth mindset, and I'm a big fan of embracing learning. And you go, that's amazing. How do I do that? I have a saying um, I saw that on the pathway of life, where you stumble is where the, the treasure is buried. 
you wouldn't believe how many times I've stumbled. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, it, it, it happens all the time. Everyone has good days. Everyone has bad days. The top snooker players, um, top golfers, there are none who are invincible. At some stage, something goes wrong. They get themselves into a, into a flow, but they have off days and they have good days. They have bad days. Things just tend to work for them for a while, and then it goes wrong again. And I was talking to a friend earlier about individual sessions. There are coaching sessions. There are some days when you're just in the flow and it feels great. And there are other days when you just go, what is going on here? And as soon as it starts to go wrong, I can feel my inner chip because he's still going to have a vote going, oh, Jay. What you need to do is hold the cue tighter. Uh, and you, you said now I've done a lot of humor today. I, I'm a really, really big fan of enjoyment. If you're in, you know, why are you playing snooker in the first place? Is to enjoy it. And if yeah. you're not enjoying it, why bother? And you find that when you enjoy it, it flows. And there, there will be days when it doesn't go right. There will be days when it just goes brilliantly. And if you can, every day, if you just, Feel what that, there's almost actually, you, you take more lessons away from the table than you do it at the table. Uh, and the more you can be in touch with yourself and the more you go, yeah, I actually feel all right here. And be, because of, you know, when you get focused on something, you, you're naturally very focused. And we live in an environment where there's lots of people very focused on things. And it, and it is a real skill to be able to step back. Uh, so I've, um, I've had lots and lots of occasions that I can feel this feel so often. There are times when I sleep at night and I follow my advice uh, and I go, right, yes, good. when I give to other people, you know, just just think about your favourite holiday or, or, or your dreams. Get in touch with your dreaming brain. There are nights when I'm lying there and I'm a bit tense and I go, all right, I've got to do this. And as soon as I say to myself, I've got to do this, I know it's me telling myself that I'm not doing it and therefore I'm a bad person. And that's why I can sort of talk about that because I'm doing it all the time. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, every every day things go wrong, uh, but the more you can enjoy it, and I I love that story you tell, Rob, because I, I remember that we we talked about it, and and flying just should be enjoyed, and as soon as you started to enjoy it, everything else flowed, and snooker, it should be enjoyed. It doesn't necessarily even matter if you win or lose, um, but if there is just, if you're just getting the genuine pleasure from striking and the pleasure of being able to control yourself before you even strike the shot and evaluate afterwards and go, yeah. And do you ever turn to yourself and say, I enjoyed that shot or I enjoyed that game or yeah, that was fun. I really, I enjoyed losing that game, whatever it was. Yeah. How often do you, do you take the time to say, yeah, that was good. That's or good. more often do you just go home and go, oh, Never. Why? And it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, in one of the very, very early episodes uh, of the QZM podcast, um, I said that you, you have bad days. And if you have a bad day, go down to the club and you're at the club, you're having a bad day. Um, set something easy up. Set something enjoyable up. Break it up. Don't, don't try and you know, beat yourself with a really hard training session. You know, set something enjoyable up. Um, and actually... It sounds like that's a fantastic opportunity to start really practicing some of the stuff that we've mentioned in this podcast today because you're in, you're already preset into that tense shoulders forward, um, heart racing, um, emotional chimp esque brain. So it's great to, to do that. Um, so just another comment here. Playing the same shot on both sides of the table. One side, I can do it. Otherwise, I miss every time. Is that a mind block or is that otherwise? Let me just answer that in terms of a technical side because we're lucky in the fact that we've got a um, technical side and a mindset side. Um, and I, we don't know what each other's going to say here, so it could be slightly conflicting. We'll, we'll talk about maybe why that is in a, in a minute. But from a technical aspect... Um, you can be better on one side of the table than the other because of sighting. If your sight alignment is not in the center and you're not seeing the ball, the angles correctly, what that means is 
each side of the table, as in whether you're playing a cut in on the left or a cut in on the right. So it's not necessarily sides of the table, but it's you know where those balls are set. And you'll be seeing the angle differently, even though it's the same angle. So what that means is when you develop the synapse in your brain by repetitive nature for um, playing that angle on the left, you play that 100 times, you only play the angle on the right 20 times, you've, you've created that synapse better playing left. So therefore, if you see the angle differently on the right-hand side, you're, you're going to miss it. So that's in terms of a technical aspect um, that's what happens. So um, make sure that your technique, your actual alignment, your sight alignment is correct. Um, and if you're if you're or off in your alignment and you're resetting to a corrected alignment, that's going to take some getting used to because you're going to see angles differently. It's going to look wrong, um, but stick with it and practice that and redevelop that synapse. But that's from the technical aspect. Anything to add on the mindset aspect, Jason? Yeah, yeah, I would probably argue that uh, there's an, an element of a mental block, but it's developed from the fact that uh, the technical side that it, you're maybe approaching it from a subtly different way. And once you've done it once, you've now started to practice it wrong. Uh, and it, it, so from, from Rob's side there, you, you see a rectangular table. Imagine if that table was infinitely long. It would be therefore technically the same shot from either side. But because it's not infinitely long, you can't help but see the rectangle. And therefore, you set yourself up differently. And once you've done it once or twice, you've now learned to play it differently. And if you then get it wrong once or twice, you've now learned to play it differently and wrong <laughs> once or twice. So you, you it, it's, it's almost it. Sorry? And you said earlier about labels, you know, essentially saying that yeah. I'm better on the left side of the table, that's labeled. And that is now... Yeah. Yeah, it, I, I would almost argue that the, the way the way ahead is to find a completely different way of initially breaking the shot down again. Maybe even play it behind your back. You know, something really stupid just to to break yourself out of this one because you will set into the same place every time. Maybe just come play. You know, imagine that you're at a pool table in a pub doing a fluke shot once or twice. See how many times you can do that. And then come back to the shot fresh again with with Rob stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. Um, look, Jason, it's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, you, we've I've, we've taken up loads of your time, and we appreciate every ounce of value you've given. And the whole hour of the podcast has been extremely valuable for for everyone uh, everyone involved that has been on the live. Um, and if you, you've been on the live, then hopefully you'll agree uh, and will join me in thanking Jason. Uh, everyone that's yet to watch it and listen to it is in for a treat um, and we'll give them that privilege and pleasure um, later in the week when we actually launch it onto all the platforms. Um, what I wanted to do is um, I just wanted to ask, because you are a performance coach, this is what you do. You've given us huge amounts of value and we all appreciate that. But if someone wants to actually take this to the next level and, and talk to you one to one uh, and actually get deep in it, how do they find you? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you've got the details, I think, on the, the bar. Uh, I have a Facebook page as well, Inflow Performance. Uh, I don't always manage to look at that. So you can also find me um, at inquiries uh, at inflowperformance.com on email. LinkedIn is probably the easiest at the moment because I've got several balls in the air with that one. And uh, find me on that, message me on that, and uh, we can talk from there. That's great. And um, just for everyone that's listening, um, Jason uh, normally does about an, uh, an hour and a half session. I say about in, in terms of, as you can tell by tonight, he's uh, an extremely kind guy and will help you out and, and will talk to you. Uh, but sessions are normally about an hour and a half long um, and are a hundred pounds. And he's, if you mention that you found him through the QZone podcast, he's very kindly offered a 20% discount, 20 pounds off and, and reduced that for us at 80 pounds um but there will be limited spaces to that so do make sure that you get in touch with jason um on his linkedin which is uh, on the banner if you're watching the video uh, otherwise for all those listening it's www.linkedin.com forward slash in i n forward slash jason dash 
Davin Hill, D-A-V-E-N-H-I-L-L, -L, or just search on LinkedIn, Jason Davin Hill, uh, and you should see him come up. There's not many of me around. There's not that many, is there? Um, if right. you're connecting to Jason, uh, do connect to me. Um, that would be fantastic. Do mention that you listened to the podcast. And um, do send us, uh, join the uh, QZM podcast Facebook group and uh, let us know uh, what you liked, what sparks any blinding flashes of the obvious that you've had, anything that you've taken away from this and gone, right, this is the one thing that I'm that's going to change my game. Um, and that's extremely exciting. Jason, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, As ever, we're really, really fun talking to you too. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, we'll get this up and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Jason. Bye-bye now.